So here is Alessandro Stavrou on Socrates' divine gift, God's providence and daimonion. Thank you, Don. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be a speaker in this uh, colloquium, which is really successful and I think contributes a lot to the importance also of this new founded society. Um, as Don said, I will refer uh, to a handout of texts. Um, sometimes I will uh, even do a close reading of those texts. So please download it, it because it will otherwise be quite difficult to follow me in some parts of my talk. In this paper, I deal with three aspects of Socrates' relationship with the divine. There, his relationship with the publicly recognized gods, and in particular with the Pan-Hellenic god Apollo. His relationship with the divine entity that resides within him and is therefore unique to him, and his belief in craft person gods who take care of humans and in particular of Socrates himself. These three aspects of Socrates' religiosity have been thoroughly studied. Scholarship has devoted an impressive amount of work to analyze and explain how Socrates' experiences of the divine relate to his philosophy. However, um, the vast majority of studies have been devoted to single features of Socrates' religiosity, in most cases without even attempting to find a common thread between them. Or the focus has been on specific accounts of Socrates' religion, such as the argument over intelligence design outlined in Xenophon's memorabilia, the oracle story reported by Plato and Xenophon, or the accounts of the daimonion, which can be found again with slight differences both in Plato and Xenophon. Little attention has been paid so far to specific features of Socrates' religiosity, such as his divine allotment, Theia Moira, or his quality of being dear to the gods, Theophiles. My aim is to provide an overall interpretation of the, the religious features of Socrates, focusing not only on Plato and Xenophon, but also on some fragments of Aeschines of Svetus. These three uh, authors point at a peculiar aspect of Socrates' relationship with the divine, to which I will devote my attention. Socrates is endowed with a divine gift, which makes him unique if compared to other Athenians of his time. As I will try to show, it is precisely thanks to his privileged relationship with the divine that Socrates is able to both perform his philosophical activity and lead a happy life. Let us move then to the first text on the handout, which is one of the most renowned passages of Socratic literature. Here we have Diogenes Laertius quoting the Roman philosopher Favorinus of Arilate, who reports the text of the charges brought against Socrates in 399 BC. The wording of the charges is nearly identical to that occurring at the beginning of Xenophon's memorabilia, as well as to other ancient reports about uh, Socrates' trial. There is a general consensus among scholars that we are dealing here with the original text of the indictment, possibly with the only extant historical document about Socrates. The text goes, Socrates is accused of breaking the law because he does not recognize the gods recognized by the city, because he introduces new daimonic beings, hetera kaina daimonia, and because he corrupts the youth. The expression kaina daimonia implies that the accusers of Socrates consider his relationship with the divine as both unique and unprecedented, but also as something strange, difficult to grasp. The noun daimonion is unspecific as it can refer both to divine and demonic beings. The plural form in which it occurs, daimonia, makes it even more unspecific suggesting that Socrates experienced the divine in multifarious ways. All of these features pose serious difficulties to all those who attempt to understand Socrates' relationship to the divine in the light of traditional phenomena of Greek religion. There just seems to be no context 
that can help understanding the unique features of Socrates' religion, except the experiences reported by himself. So we will deal with uh, those experiences in this talk. In Plato's Apology, we read that the principal accuser of Socrates, the poet Miletus, thinks that the three charges were linked to each other, text two. Socrates does not recognize the Polyad gods in the way other Athenians do, because he claims to have a privileged relationship with the divine. But this relationship is not a private one, since he teaches Kaina Daimonia to the young. <clears throat> this indicates that the majority of the Athenians perceived Socrates' relig religiosity as closely related to his philosophical activity. This view can be found in the next set of passages, which are drawn from the oracle story reported by Plato in his Apology. The well-known story goes that Chirifon, a close associate of Socrates, sets out to the Delphic oracle um, to ask if any man was wiser than Socrates, text three. The Pythia answers that no one is. Confronted with this statement, Socrates is puzzled, text four. On the one hand, he knows that he is not wise either much or little. On the other, he has an unshakable faith in the God's incapability of lying. This condition of bewilderment triggers a process that is described in texts five to eight. Socrates starts an investigation with the aim of refuting the oracle, text five. He sets out to question and examine all those fellow citizens who have a reputation of being wiser than him. This attracts the hate of the Athenians, text six, but Socrates does not give up his inquiry because he now feels compelled to carry on his research. His investigation has now become a necessity, anankayon, therefore he must complete it, iteon. In text seven, we, we learn that Socrates investigates on account of the God, and that this investigation is extremely toilsome. After the toilsome process of refuting the pretense of wisdom of his fellow citizens, Socrates becomes aware that he might prove the oracle irrefutable. This entails that he does not succeed in refuting the oracle as he initially intended to do. On the contrary, he must now admit that the oracle was right in identifying him as the wisest of all men and that he was wrong in thinking he knew nothing at all. Text four. This leads him to the conclusion that he indeed has a knowledge namely that of knowing he knows nothing, and that it is precisely due to this very knowledge that the oracle has proclaimed him the wisest of all men. The investigation he performs has therefore the purpose to make him aware of the wisdom he already has. It does not aim at making him different from what he already is. This becomes clear in text eight, where he comes to the conclusion that he should not even try to acquire the fallible wisdom nor the pretense of knowledge of his fellow citizens, but instead remain as he is, hosper eco ekein, as such a condition brings him more advantage than anything else. This statement is crucial for understanding the meaning of the whole elenctic process so Socrates has carried out so far. Socrates is wise, not because he has learned something that makes him wise. On the contrary, he derives his wisdom from the fact that he has found out that he has no knowledge and that having no knowledge is the best possible condition for him. It is thanks to the oracle that he comes to this awareness. The oracle prompts him to examine the wise man of his city and this examination makes him understand that he should avoid acquiring new knowledge because he already knows, um, owns all the wisdom a human being should possess. This, it is important to note that Socrates owes to Apollo his awareness of being the wisest of, of all men. In text nine, we see that this awareness means to him also a duty toward the God. Socrates conducts his investigation on account of the Delphic God. 
He regards his elective activity as a help or even a worship he provides to Apollo. Like a warrior, he has been stationed in Athens by Apollo with a duty to philosophize by examining both himself and others, text 10. The metaphor of the warrior is key to understand other passages in which Socrates defines his philosophical activity as a service, a hyperesia he performs on account of the goal. Such service is beneficial not only for Socrates himself and the gods, as we have seen, but also for the city of Athens, text 11. Serving the god means for Socrates to take care of his fellow citizens, reproaching them to pursue the virtue of the soul and thus become better human beings. Therefore, there is no greater good for the city than Socrates' service to the god which he will pursue even if his fellow citizens will try to impede him to do so. A passage from the Euthyphro clarifies the religious implication of Socrates' service to the God, text 12. Piety is here defined as a specific kind of therapeia for the, for the gods. It consists of a care within a strongly hierarchical relationship similar to that provided by slaves to their masters. For this reason, the care for the gods is defined by Socrates as a hyperesia, a service to the gods. As other kinds of hyperesia, the service to the gods has the goal to achieve a deed, an ergon that is specific to that activity. As the ergon specific to serving shipbuilding is to build a ship, that of serving house building to build a house, the ergon of serving the gods is to achieve many fine things. That is to achieve benefits that are not limited to a specific realm of reality. This definition fits well with what we have seen in text 11. Socrates' service to Apollo is to advantage not only of this god, but also of Socrates himself and his fellow citizens. For this reason, Socrates cannot refrain from performing his philosophical activity. For him, it is impossible to keep quiet because this would mean not performing the divine service to the God the God has assigned to him for the well-being of Athens. Sticking to the God's order of questioning and examining his fellow citizens is on the contrary a megiston agaton, the greatest good a man can achieve for himself and for others. It is important uh, that Socrates' philosophical activity is described here as something that comes about without Socrates' will, as a gift allotted to him by a divine chance. The verb tuncano hints at an ability that Socrates receives from the god, regardless of his acts or choices. We find this very idea also in Xenophon, who in his Apology also hints at goods Socrates receives from the gods, text 14. Here we also find the verb tuncano indicating that Socrates was allotted greater benefits than every other man. These goods consist of the divine guidance Socrates receives through dreams and divination. In text 15, we see that Socrates has absolute trust in the signs he gets from the gods. Under no circumstance would he discard them, and every time others did something contrary to them, he would accuse them of madness. He owes an unconditional obedience to the counsels of the gods and gives them absolute priority over everything human. Quite like Plato, Xenophon Socrates links such obedience to an activity one should perform to the advantage of the gods. Following their orders is the best way not only to honor, but also to please them. As we see at the end of text 16, Socrates not only recommends to others absolute obedience toward the gods, he also provides such obedience in his own words and deeds. By behaving the way Socrates did, humans can cherish the justified hope to receive from the gods the greatest possible goods. The wording of the expression Xenophon uses here, megista agata, reminds of what we have seen in Plato's Apology, 
where Socrates declares that for the city, there is no greater good made on Agathon than his service to the God. This was text 11. And that the greatest good given to a man, the Megiston Agathon, is to discuss every day about virtue as Socrates does by examining his fellow citizens. This was text 13. These passages show that Xenophon agrees with Plato in pointing out that Socrates had a privileged relationship with the divine from which he draws every possible good. Such good is not merely self-referential, however. It is beneficial also to the gods and those who associate with Socrates. Where Xenophon seems to diverge from Plato is in his account of the oracle story. Contrary to Plato, who shows how the oracle prompts Socrates to devote his life to elenctically examine the citizens of Athens, Xenophon in insists on the different virtues the oracle attributes to Socrates. According to the Delphic God, no man was more free-spirited or juster or more disciplined than Socrates, text 17. No one was less enslaved to the appetites of the body than Socrates. No one more free-spirited than him, as he never accepted gifts or payment for, uh, from anybody. And no one was juster than him, since he needed nothing from others. Finally, the oracle proclaims Socrates also a wise man, but not the, the wisest of all men, as we have seen in Plato. Xenophon does not deny that the wisdom plays an important part for Socrates, but it is clear to him that wisdom is not the most important quality of Socrates. Where Xenophon again agrees with Plato is in describing how the oracle impacts on Socrates, as in Plato's Apology, where Socrates undergoes labors to refute the oracle, also here Socrates struggles, eponon, to seek and learn any good thing he can. In both cases, the outcome is the same. As a con consequence of the oracle, Socrates will associate with his fellow citizens, with some of, of his fellow citizens, and develop a stable sinusia with them. The three virtues the oracle attributes to Socrates, more than to any other man, point at the quality that is typical of Xenophon Socrates, that of self-sufficiency, uh, autarkia. Autarkia plays a central role in Xenophon. The core features of his Socrates, namely the physical endurance, carteria, and the ability to tame inner desires, enkrateia, are in fact only prerequisites to attain self-sufficiency, a condition that according to Xenophon is in itself divine, text 18. The divinity deriving from autarkia is the best possible condition a man can achieve and therefore equal to happiness, eudaimonia. Now, if we merge this statement with what Xenophon claims about Socrates' virtues, we get a clear cut picture. No one is more free-spirited, just, and disciplined than Socrates. But this does not mean that he's a god. He is still a man, even if he has the divine quality of autarkia. But this specific gift makes him different, better, and happier than all other men. However, Socrates is not the only human being who receives goods from the gods. In chapters 1-4 and 4-3 of Memorabilia, Xenophon develops a teleology of the divine that is explicitly anthropocentric. Human beings are the product of intelligent design since they exhibit signs of forethought that are clearly purposeful. But the gods constantly care about them, providing them with all the goods they need, see text 19. This entails that not only Socrates, but all men are endowed with gifts coming from the God. In text 20, Euthydemus asks Socrates whether the gods perform any other ergon than caring about human beings. They do after all care also about other animals, other beings. So what is the peculiar status of humans? 
Socrates answers that both the domesticated and the non-domesticated animals provide benefits to humans. This implies that the care the gods provide for animals is also, albeit indirectly, a care they provide to humans. In text 23, we can see uh, what the care of the gods consists of. Socrates points out that human beings are incapable of foreseeing what is useful to them. Gods help them in two ways. First, by telling them what is going to happen. Second, by teaching them how to achieve what is best for them. As Euthydemus remarks, however, gods are more friendly with Socrates than with other men. To him, they provide even unasked signs as to what he should do and what he should not do while to others, they provide signs only when they are consulted. Again, we can see that Socrates' relationship with the divine is a privileged one. Contrary to all other men, he does not need divination in order to foresee what is going to happen and to understand what he should do to obtain the best possible outcome in a given situation. If we look at text 22, it seems that the gods help Socrates providing him with signs because they are particularly benevolent toward him. This idea occurs also in two other passages where Socrates is defined as Theophiles, dear to the gods. Text 23 is particularly telling. We are here at the very end of the apology. Xenophon takes the floor and declares that in his own opinion, Socrates, had been allotted a fate favored by the gods, Theophilus Moiras Tetukekenai. He backs up this claim with two arguments. The first is that Socrates left the most difficult thing in life. The second, that he was allotted the most untroubled of all deaths. The sentence needs to be examined carefully. Translators normally render the first clause to bio to kalipotaton apelipe with he left the most toilsome part of his life. I don't think this makes much sense since this would imply that Socrates' life had toilsome and less toilsome moments. We do not know anything about such distinction, at least not in Xenophon. To me, it seems clear that the first clause deals with the kind of life Socrates led, which was most toilsome, while the second clause is about the kind of death he experienced, which was most untroubled. The toilsomeness mentioned here fits well with what we have seen in text 17, where we read that Socrates' labor was essential for convincing Athenians and non-Athenians to become his associates. It is important to note that according to Socrates, being Theophiles implies such labor as only those who perform virtuous deeds deserve the lo love of the gods. Those who are dearest to the gods, Theophiles Tatoi, are those who are excellent at their job, while those who don't are neither useful nor dear to the gods, as we see in text 24. This fits well with a well-known fact, namely that throughout Xenophon's Socratic works, Socrates' job consists precisely in being useful to those who associate with him. It has long been noted that the whole memorabilia are a testimony to Socrates' usefulness to his companions and fellow citizens. See, for example, text 25. Socrates was helpful to them both in deed, ergoi, showing them the person he was, and by conversing with them, dialegomenos. This implies that Socrates was dear to the gods because he was good at his deeds, which consists of being useful to others. We have seen that the second argument for Socrates' status as Theophiles is that he was allotted the most untroubled of deaths. This fits with another passage of memorabilia, text 26, where we read that no man died ever more nobly than Socrates, who was admired for living in good spirits and contentedly. 
And because Socrates dies as the happiest man ever, his death is also the, the dearest to the gods. This suggests that even if Socrates' life implied the most toilsome of duties, that of convincing Athenians and non-Athenians to associate with him, his autarkia enabled him to be always cheerful and happy with his condition. We have already seen that Socrates owns the divine quality of autarkia, and that this quality yields him happiness. Now we can see that such happiness cannot be clouded even by death. It is important to note that Socrates dies not just as a happy man. According to Xenophon, his death is the happiest of all. The same applies to his being dear to the gods. As no death is happier than that of Socrates, the gods love it more than anyone else's. It seems therefore that the qualities of being happy and dear to the gods are linked to each other since both refer to a specific excellence of Socrates. Both adjectives, eudaimon and Theophiles, in their superlative and comparative forms, respectively, define qualities Socrates is endowed with more than anyone else. The only other instance of eudaimonistatos in Xenophon's Socratic works occurs at the very end of memorabilia, where after a whole range of key virtues, such as eusebeia, dikaiosune, enkrateia, phronesis, and autarkia, this very quality, that of eudaimonia, in its superlative form, is listed as the ultimate feature of Socrates. But there is more to it. In Xenophon's corpus of writings, the adjective eudaimon in the superlative forms occurs a dozen of times, mostly in the plural, to define a group of people, or in some cases, of cities. Socrates is the only individual person whom Xenophon defines as eudaimonistatos. Something similar applies to Theophiles. In text 26, we have a comparative, but the wording clearly suggests that we are dealing here with a quality that is unique to Socrates. In Xenophon's corpus, the superlative for Theophilistatos occurs only twice, without reference to specific persons. As for Eudaimon, the gift of being more Theophilus than any other man belongs only to Socrates. Other heroes pra pra praised by Xenophon, such as Cyrus, Agesileus, or Lycurgus, do not have this status. The uniqueness of Socrates is therefore closely related to his privileged relationship with the divine. Not only does Socrates lead life according to his divine quality of autarkia, which makes him a happy man, he displays such quality even more at the moment of his death and is therefore beloved by the gods. The most clear cut evidence for Socrates' divine gift are passages in which he claims to entertain an exclusive relationship with a divine entity that is accessible only to him. The most famous instance is text 27 from Plato's Apology. Here Socrates declares that since childhood, he heard a voice that always turned him away from things he was about to do, but never encouraged him to do anything. This voice always withheld him from participating in politics. This saved his life and enabled him to be useful to both his fellow citizens and himself. Scholars often refer to this text to highlight the apotreptic feature of the daimonion. However, the general meaning of the passage suggests that the daimonion is not only holding Socrates back from politics, but also safeguarding his life, thus providing Athens with the benefit of his philosophical activity. This entails that the positive aspect of the daimonion is patent. On the contrary, its status is far from clear. Socrates himself is uncertain if the daimonion is a divine or a demonic entity and he describes its appearance as something which happens or occurs to him. This parallels with what we have seen in text 13, namely that the service Socrates performs 
on behalf of the god Apollo is something that has been allotted to him by a tike, an unscrutable divine chance. It seems that the daimonion uh, that intervenes in Socrates' life does so in the same way the oracle does, that is, as a gift that befalls him without his will or intervention. In text 28, we see that the daimonion is peculiar to Socrates and few other individuals before him. It is a private internal in religious experience that points at a privileged relationship with the divine. Only the small group of those who enjoyed the demonic sign through Socrates have experienced the pleasure and the delight deriving from it. Again, we can see that the daimonion is not merely apotreptic as it yields an undisputable benefit to all those who associate with Socrates. Such benefit is even more evident in the case of Socrates' death. As for Xenophon, also in Plato, Socrates dies as a happy man. In text 29, Socrates recalls that the daimonion did not oppose him when he went to court, nor when he held his defense speech. The reason is that from Socrates' perspective, the death sentence and death itself may well be fine things. In the final passage of Apology, text 30, Socrates clarifies that a good man cannot be harmed either in life or in death, since his affairs are not neglected by the gods. The daimonion does not oppose Socrates because the best possible option is for him to die and not to escape or go into exile. So even in this case, the daimonion provides Socrates with what is best for him in that given situation. In Xenophon, the daimonion explicitly offers positive advice. See text 31 and 32. It is equated either with God or with omens, such as those coming from birds, human utterances and prophets. And like gods and omens, it provides positive advice for anything that needs to be done or known. In text 32, Socrates defends himself against the accusation of having introduced new daimonic beings, kaina daimonia. As the daimonion is nothing but the voice of the god, Socrates does not introduce new divinities. The god indicated here in the singular is very likely the god of the oracle, namely the Delphic Apollo. The expression, the voice of the god that reveals itself signaling what needs to be done, clearly shows that this god is distinct from its manifestation, which is unique to Socrates. For Xenophon's Socrates, the daimonion is therefore not identical to god or the divine, as some scholars have recently claimed but to what gods and particularly Apollo communicate to him through signs. And since Apollo and other gods provide Socrates with signs even unasked, as we have seen in text 21, Socrates is the only human being who has the privilege of being warned about what he should do and what he should not do, even if he does not consult the gods. The daimonion is therefore unique to Socrates but the benefit deriving from it can be transferred from him to, uh, to his associates. A commonly held view is that the daimonion provides advice only to Socrates. This is not entirely true. A passage from the Apology, text 33, shows that the benefits Socrates derives from the daimonion yield joy and delight also to his associates. It is a pleasure for them to hear Socrates question and examine those who think are wise but are not. We have already seen that Socrates' elenctic quest was ordered to him by the Delphic Apollo. In this passage, Plato specifies that this order had been communicated to Socrates through oracles, dreams, and every other way a divine dispensation, a teia moira, has ever ordered a man to do anything. This statement is very important since Plato established here a link between Socrates' religiosity and a key concept of Greek religion, that of Moira. Since the times of the Homeric poems, 
The term Moira had been used to define a portion of life, joys, or goods that the gods allot to a specific human being. The wording employed by Plato, Theia Moira, divine dispensation, implies an allotment that is unique to Socrates. To him, and only to him, the gods have assigned a portion of the divine. We have already seen that such allotment implies a duty Socrates must fulfill, that of electrically examining himself and others. Here it becomes clear that the command to philosophize comes not directly from Apollo, but from a variety of signs through which Apollo sends his orders. The most important of these signs is the divine portion Socrates is endowed with as we see in text 34. Here we learn that the Theia Moira plays a major role, not only for conveying the command of Apollo to Socrates, but also for understanding the origin of his own daimonion. For it is precisely by divine dispensation, Theia Moira, that Socrates has been accompanied by the daimonion since childhood. And this daimonion would never prescribe anything, as we have already seen, but only hold back Socrates and his associates from doing things they could regret. Also in this case, the function of the daimonion is far from being merely apotreptic. Its benefits are evident, since it is precisely thanks to the daimonion that those who associate with Socrates, even for a short time, become obviously better than those they had been worse uh, than before. The passage from the Theagas is crucial since it provides a very important piece to the puzzle we have been reconstructing so far. The evidence suggests that the Theia Mora functions as a link between the divine outside Socrates, which is the order of the god Apollo, and the divine that commands him from within, the daimonion. Apollo sends his orders to Socrates through the Theia Moira, and due to this Peritaria Moira, Socrates can draw on the advice of the daimonion. Both of these religious experiences turn out to be unfailingly correct. Both Plato and Xenophon remark that in no single instance, Apollo or the daimonion have ever proven wrong. This gives us a clue to better understand Socrates' choices in crucial moments of his life. In following the commands of the oracle and of the daimonion, he cannot be wrong, nor even can he be wrong in pursuing the activities both of them imposed to him, that of electrically examining his fellow citizens and be useful to them by making them better human beings. Theia Moira plays therefore a crucial role in the improvement of Socrates' associates. This finds confirmation in the next two passages on the handout, number 35 and 36, which are drawn from Aeschines of Stratus' Alcibiades. In text 35, Socrates claims that he is useful to Alcibiades, not due to a craft, which implies a firm possession of knowledge, but thanks to an ability he has not learned, which has been allotted to him by a Theia Moira. Such ability relies on a desire, an epitomia, which enables Socrates to provide benefits to his associates. In text 36, Socrates has no wisdom he can teach Alcibiades. He improves him not by providing him with notions such as those usually imparted in human crafts, but only through his love. Such love is an inspirational force Socrates resembles the possessed Bacche, who are able to draw milk and honey from wells from which others cannot draw even water. So does Socrates with Alcibiades. Thanks to his erotic possession, he improves him um, by not improving his wisdom, but his whole personality. Aeschines does not mention the Delphic Oracle, nor does he mention the Daimonion. But it is crystal clear um, um, that he states, I mean, that uh, Socrates improves Alcibiades thanks to his Theia Moira. The erotic possession is, is something only Socrates owns, a divine within him that comes about without his will. 
it happens to him, a twin canon, as a divine allotment he is not responsible of. This entails that Socrates' divine gift is not something he can control. It is a benevolent force that befalls him in specific moments as an ability that aims at the welfare of those he associates with. This other oriented feature of Socrates' religiosity is made explicit toward the end of Xenophon's memorabilia, text 37. Socrates recalls how he chose to abstain from presenting a defense speech because of the intervention of the daimonion. He also followed the advice of the daimonion when he decided not to escape death after having been condemned. Socrates also notes that no man ever lived better and more pleasantly than him. He adds an important specification. His happiness came about without his will as a gift allotted to him by chance, which he became aware of in an equally fortuitous way. The verbs sumbaino and tuncano hint at a condition that comes about regardless of Socrates' acts or choices. This hints at a continuity between the optimum of Socrates' death, when the intervention of the daimonion makes him realize that the best option for him consists in not escaping the death penalty, and the optimum Socrates achieves in life, in a life devoted to philosophy, which is preferable to that of any other human being. It is important to note, however, that by realizing his own optimum, Socrates becomes a source of inspiration for all those who associate with him. By joining him, they become better. The Sinusia described in text 38 clarifies an important aspect of Socrates' religious experiences. Socrates improves his interlocutors because he has a privileged relationship with the divine. He perceives such relationship as an intervention by chance, by his daimonion or by a god. This intervention reverberates on his associates who benefit from it being improved by Socrates. I now come to the conclusions. We have seen that Socrates' relationship with the divine plays a crucial role for a variety of aspects linked to his activity as a philosopher. His elenctic quest is motivated by the Oracle of Apollo. His protective activity aimed at making others better is linked to a divine entity within him. And his awareness of being dear to the gods relies on the idea that the world is the product of an intelligent design conceived by craftspersons gods, and that these gods care about humans and in particular Socrates himself. All of these religious experiences are unique to Socrates, but thanks to his activity, his associates and fellow citizens can benefit from them. By electrically examining others and making them better human beings, Socrates fulfills the commands coming from a divine that has been allotted only to him. Plato, Xenophon, and, and Aeschines agree in seeing in this divine gift the distinctive feature of Socrates' religiosity, from which all of its aspects seem to be implicitly or explicitly derived. All right, um, thank you. I'll clap on behalf of all the muted participants. Um, and uh, now it's time for discussion. I, um, I invite you to use the raise your hand function if you want to make a comment or ask a question. No need to be shy. Oh, wait, uh, Nick Smith. Hi, uh, that was fun uh, and, and very interesting. Uh, I, I actually just wanted to ask about uh, two details. Um, and in one case, I just wanted to see how you are putting things together. And the other, I may just not have heard you right. So they're fairly small uh, detail questions. Um, the first has to do with your uh, the, the way you 
put together um, T4 and T5 on the handout. Mm -hmm. So in T4, which appears just a couple of lines above T5, he says that it's Uthemis um, for the God to lie. Mm -hmm. But then in T5, he says he's going to Elenchon the Oracle. And you emphasized this, I, as I heard you, you emphasized that you took that to mean refute. And I would normally understand refute to be in conflict with the notion that it's euthemist for the God to lie. Um, that is, it, it, you can't refute it if it's not false. Um, so, so I'm just wondering how you were putting those two together. And the next one is an even smaller point. And that just quickly has to do with your, what you do with T23, um, where you understood the most toilsome thing in life as um, sort of just a characteristic of Socrates' whole life. And whenever I, when I read that passage in Xenophon, when I've read it, it always seemed to me that what he was talking about there was not the sort of character of Socrates' whole life as being sort of lacking in toilsome bits, but that what, what he was actually avoiding was the toilsomeness of, you know, the illness and infirmities of old age, of, of, of very advanced age. And so I thought it was really just limited to those things and not a characterization of um, the whole life. Anyway, th those were my, um, Thank my you, Nick. comments. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, okay, first uh, qu first question about T4 and T5. Um, what I think is uh, that a process is going on. I insisted very much on this processual character of the Socrates' uh, argument. Um, he uh, first, think, uh, first thinks that the oracle may be wrong and he sets out to refute it, but in the end, he proves the oracle to be irrefutable. So he tries to refute it, but he doesn't succeed. And um, this is why uh, putting texts together may seem awkward, but I think it fits with the idea that we have a process here with things going on that change during the process. So even Socrates' mind changes about the oracle. He first thinks uh, the oracle is certain, must be wrong because I know, I know nothing. And then at the end, he realizes that the oracle was right and, he, and that Socrates himself um, more or less is refuted at the, at the end of the whole process. And what you say about uh, 23, um, I am convinced that this um, kalipotes, which we have here, this um, toughness, toilsomeness, Socrates refers to, must have to do uh, something to do with the ponoi he undergoes to, to be a virtuous person. And um, because there is uh, here a, a um, this uh, neutral form, to um, kalipoteton, which is of course referred to a something which is very kalipos, very uh, toilsome. And what is this something? I don't think it can it can be a part of the life. It must be something very specific and very important for Socrates, which, in my opinion, is his uh, duty to philosophize, which is linked to Ponoi. We have seen this Ponoi in Apology, where he, uh, we have even this uh, very weird formulation, Ponos, uh, Ponoi, um, uh, how is it? Uh, ponoi Ekponuntos, something like this. So he, he had Ponoi, which were taught some for him. And, um, and then we have Ponoi in, uh, in Xenophon, so uh, even there we have this uh, idea that Socrates is struggling to, to achieve uh, his uh, status as a philosopher. And here we have Kalipotes, which is the same quality by the way Xantippe has. <laughs> the wife of Socrates is also Kalipotate, I mean, very toilsome. And so I think the toilsomeness has to do with his philosophical mission, not with illnesses or infirmities. This is how I read this passage. Uh, Gabriel Danzig. Hi, Alessandro. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting mm -hmm. presentation, and which brings together, you know, such a wide variety of sources 
to make sense out of Xenoph out of Socrates' uh, religiosity. The, the the concern that I have is with the idea that these all fit together. Um, when I look at Xenophon's apology, I don't see any reference to a divine mission. Um, and I think Michael Stokes in an, uh, wrote an article in which he said, even within Plato, we don't see a lot of references. He speaks of it, I think, as the greatest secret of a lifetime, since there's no references to it anywhere. Um, so um, he, 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 he suspects that Plato may have invented it, or maybe that Socrates himself invented it at the time of the trial. Um, but whether it was invented or not, I don't see it in, in, in Xenophon. And I, so I have two ways in which I would want to distinguish Xenophon's apology from Plato's. That's the theological one. But there's also a literary one, which is, which is that Xenophon's is much shorter and it's really focused on the charge that Socrates made, acted foolishly on the day of his trial and on the days leading up to it. Uh, so I think there's less of an emphasis on the whole life uh, of Socrates and more of an emphasis on whether or not he behaved foolishly in, in defending himself. And, and that's why I think, that's why I, I tend to agree with Nick that the, that, that a sentence is referring to the fact that, um, you know, he, he, he didn't have to suffer with the, at the end of his life, because that's what makes the, his behavior at the trial not foolish, but actually successful. He succeeded because he got himself killed and he avoided the terrible end of life. By the way, just as a side note, Cephalus in the beginning of the Republic tells Socrates that it's not worth it to get old. I don't know if that's something that Xenophon is picking up on here, but um, that's a just slightly different way of reading the, of reading that, um, of reading that, uh, that statement. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, actually, uh, I also I, I agree with you about the divine mission, but I don't think it is a mission because um, I, you, I always read about this um, divine mission, but this mission is translate the translation of hyperesia, and hyperesia is not a mission. Hyperesia is a service. So I don't think even in the uh, in Plato's Apology we have any mission. I think uh -huh. there we have a service to the gods. And this service fits very well with Xenophon. So uh, if we, um, um, can, if we depart from this idea that in, in Plato's uh, apology, we have a mission, uh, then things are much easier to fit uh, between, I think, Plato and Xenophon. And what you say about the the fact that in Plato's, in, in sorry, in uh, Xenophon's apology, we have a much shorter version because um, Xenophon is focused on, on the charges. Yes, of course, uh, this is perfectly true. Uh, but um, as I said, I think that this um, um, neutral form of Kalipotaton uh, uh, must refer to something which is uh, very, very important and which cannot be just illnesses and I mean you you have when you you get very old. I think this was never a, a problem for Socrates. I don't think he ever had any thoughts about this. At least we don't have any evidence for this. So we, if there is any evidence, I will immediately withdraw my, my interpretation. Well, there's, I mean, just in the beginning of the apology, he says that the gods um, want to save me from the degeneration of my mind uh, okay. and I won't be able to be functional anymore. So this sentence seems to be the okay. simply okay. the fulfillment of that earlier statement. Okay, I, I overlooked that. Okay, Gabriel, I will look at that. I overlooked this completely. I didn't even know that at the beginning or recall that at the beginning of the apology, he says this, this, okay, this is an argument. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will look at it. On Lance. Um, hi, my internet is acting up. So let me know if I fade out, please. Okay. So I just have a short comment and then a two part question. So I think you're very right. I think this is all over the place. And my comment is that philosophy departments often ignore this in the way they teach Socrates. And it really is central, I think. I just read a long story in the New York Times last night why the field of classics should be abolished and eliminated. And this 
this kind of reading is a good reason not, and not just to leave it to the historians of philosophy. But my question is um, that, uh, how do you think, do you think that Socrates sees himself as a prophet? This language seems to be in both Plato and Xenophon. Even Plato, who, for whom the, um, the demonian is only apotropaic, uh, can you hear me? It says my internet is acting yes, up. Yes, I can hear you, yes. Thank you. Even Plato talks about, hey, Monty K, in one of your passages, 40A, Apology. And Xenophon said, and Socrates predicts about something about the son of Melitus, or is it the son of Anatus? And he predicts it will come true. And Xenophon says his advice was always correct, meaning it always worked out well, as he predicted. And so he seems to have this language of, himself being a seer. So can I ask a second part? So I was interested in this fragment of Eschines that you can either have a techne or a divine gift. And if Socrates says he doesn't have a techne and he has a divine gift, that might make him like a seer. And one term for that is demiorgas. In Homer and even in Plato sometimes, certain workers, craftsmen, builders, poets, seers, have a gift from the gods, that seems to be the original meaning of Demi or Gas. So maybe that would apply. Maybe that would just be another way to say it. Okay, could you, so could you just talk about this idea yes, that he might be- so much. Um, might But be, I didn't quite get it. Uh, Demi or Gas means in a Homer seer. Is, is that, is, are uh, you- it may, well, it, it may, there, are several, there are several types of skills which come under that label and what they have in common is that they have a divine gift. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a, is a woodworker, by the way, a tectone. One is a poet, one is a seer. Mm -hmm. So the one argument, there are two views of this, but one view, which is my view also, mm -hmm. is that it's a divine gift. And Plato talks that way sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. As to Socrates, uh, prophet um, or seer, um, I think, uh, the, the, the main issue is that um, in Plato, in Xenophon, in Aeschines, uh, we have Socrates um, performing an activity, which is not that of foreseeing events. This is not the, the aim of what he's doing. He's, the aim of what he's doing is to make Athenians, companions, associates, fellow citizens, better men. So he uses this divine gift not to foresee events as seers do or prophets do, he uses it to make people better. So um, I think this is the main difference between Socrates and prophets. Okay. Socrates is doing something um, for the city um, by uh, having this, I mean, I mean, starting or departing from this divine gift. As to the passage of um, Eschines, I think it's a wonderful, uh, I mean, those two passages are really extraordinary because they're, they really show that uh, it's not about uh, knowledge. I mean, what Socrates does. Um, Socrates has no techne because he doesn't know how he owns this gift. I think this is the, the, the core meaning of those, um, of those passages. He is not, aware, not even aware of uh, how uh, this divine gift came to him. And um, of course, this is very similar to, to divine inspiration, because in these passages we have enteoi. I mean, Socrates has this, uh, uh, this uh, erotic possession within him. So he is an enteos, he is enthusiast, as the poets are. So there is, I, th I think, there a, a parallel between, of course, uh, uh, inspirational texts, uh, which uh, we find in poetry at the beginning of Hesiod's Theogony, or uh, I mean, in many other places of, of ancient literature. So thank you, of course, uh, uh, the things fit together very well, I mean. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a question from Martha Beck. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have to apologize because I, I uh, have taught at a small liberal arts school and I've been the only philosopher. So I actually do, I live like 
Plato in his academy. You know, I have students who are going to go off and be leaders. They're not specialists. And so I've had to sort of wing it in terms of um, figuring out, you know, who I think Socrates is and all that. But um, so in the Phaedo, he says, it makes sense to him that there's a divine noose, right? That would be intelligent design. And then I have my noose and he says, everything I've done with my life has been driven by my noose. And so when he says that though, it seems like Plato has mythologized Socrates. Everybody has a noose. Um, Plato's Republic says, the goal of this kind of education is the education of noose. And then um, when there are friendships, they in the tragedies and elsewhere, the friendship bond is we have a common mind, a common noose. But um, that it's, it's intuition, right? And so I went to Jungian psychology about mythology. It's trying to educate your intuition. And your noose is what's tied to your emotions and your character and your idea of the good. And so then you tie your intellectual virtues, Ap Apollo, to wisdom, which the Delphic Oracle did, right? It was guided by wisdom. And so at the Oracle also, um, criminals would come there and they would decide their punishment, which means it always gives you a riddle. It gives you a question because your intuition has to be active in order to be part of your character, right? And so that's why I'm agreeing with you that Socrates was given a riddle by the Oracle, but that's like life is a riddle. Everybody who comes there is given a riddle. And so the whole Greek thing is that your intuition is active and alive and engaged. And there isn't anyone um, there's no logos for virtue, it's an aragon. So you're always trying to do the good. So my, um, so that's part of it is that Socrates is and isn't every person, right? And he, everyone has a mind. That's why when he associates with them, they can get better because they have this capacity, but it's all up to them whether they really do it. And then my last, question is, if this is actually related to the, the Times article to get rid of the classics or whatever, because I think if somebody really wanted to be Socratic, it's exactly like Athens. Socrates watched Athens lose its democracy. And every day he's going out there trying to get accountability and transparency, and he's failing. And Athens did lose its democracy. So I've been doing that in America for 20 years in small town Arkansas. Every day I go out and I don't know what the students are going to say about virtue or God. You know, you just get them and you don't tell them because that polarizes. It's exactly this polarization that's going to kill democracy. So I think Socrates is the model of what all of us really ought to be doing. And ironically, lots of us get rewarded for sitting in our silos, right? And talking to each other, which is really the opposite of what Socrates is doing. And I think this relates to your, all your material as a whole, right? I do think you're right to see it as a whole. And I do think you're right. A lot of things I agree with you. I just wanted to throw that out as a way to articulate, you know, I don't know, help you or you disagree with it or whatever, but this whole level of the mind being active and, and Socrates is doing what all of us should be doing, but it's so much safer to stay home, especially during COVID and just comb through texts, you know? And so I do that too. I write books about Socrates live the life, but I'm not living the life. I'm sitting in my office writing books. Right, and it's very, you know, it's not healthy. So those are my questions. Um, okay, thank you. I, I, they're not questions. I mean, I don't think they are questions, are they? But um, in any case, I agree with you that the, um, the Oracle is a riddle. 
also for Socrates. So he has to solve the riddle to interpret the oracle. But um, the peculiar um, thing about Socrates is that he receives uh, the oracle and then he sets out to refute it. And this, um, uh, this activity he performs, this process, which starts with the oracle, leads him to Elenchos, to electrically examine his fellow citizens. And um, this is an activity that involves the whole city of Athens. So it has a huge impact on, uh, on Athens, on his fellow citizens. It leads to the trial. He is convicted to death. It has huge consequences. So uh, he does not limit himself just to interpreting a riddle as, I don't know, uh, Krasos did or Giges did or other famous personalities who went to Delphi and who got their oracle and tried to to interpret it. They did not. They uh, they, did, they they then did not do what Socrates did with this um, oracle. I mean, it, it, it did have those consequences for, I mean, for a whole city. Um, as to news, I didn't think about news in my conference because I had enough material to discuss. Uh, but of course, it would be interesting to see uh, how news fits into this whole picture. Uh, I don't think news uh, is very compatible with Teia Moira in any case. And I think Teia Moira is maybe the most important notion I discussed today, uh, because I find Teia Moira in many places where you don't have this occurrence, where you have only Tuncano or Strimbaino or other verbs, which in my um, reading refer to this uh, divine allotment or something which comes to Socrates without his will. But of course, I will look at, at the nose. It's a very good hint. Thank you. Don, uh, there, is, there is also David Constant uh, writing something on the chat. Oh, uh, uh, yes. There's lots, of, lots of discussion going on in the chat. About, about and, and Monos, yeah. which is very interesting yeah. to me because I think David, uh, by the way, hi, David. Nice to have you here. Um, you're an expert of emotions, so I think no one better than you knows what ponos and karipotes is. But what I want to say about this, uh, because I even read Gabriel saying there is not much ponos in, in Xenophon. But there is one passage I devoted my attention to, which is the Xanthippi passage in, um, in, the, in the symposium. Uh, where there is this story about Xanthippi, why, uh, I mean, Antisthenes asks Socrates, why do you have a wife which is Kalipotate, which is the most irritating, toilsome person ever? And Socrates says, I need her. I do not want to change her. I will not educate her because I need her, Kalipotes, in order to train so as to be able to. Um, to meet any possible person in my uh, mission. <laughs> we can use that in my service to the city, in my uh, Elenkos. So Xantipe functions there, her uh, Kalipotes functions there as a, um, an exercise, one could say a palestra, Socrates uses, Socrates needs in order to be able to perform his um, Elenkic quest. So um, in that case, I would say yes with Nick Smith that Kalepata uh, Kala, uh, I mean, the good things are toilsome, uh, especially for Socrates, and especially if you look at specific passages. Okay. This was my contribution to that. Um. All right, uh, Silvana Krisakopoulou. She's muted. Uh, Silvana, I think you're muted. Could you unmute yourself? Okay, thank you. I think that David uh, raised his hand to answer Alessandro right, right now. Maybe he yes, should speak was, first. It was just, you're yes. right. Uh, Maybe he should speak comment. first. You can continue. Uh, uh, okay, shall I, shall I speak? Okay. Go, Hello. go ahead. 
Okay. Hello, Alessandro. Nice. Nice seeing you after more than a year. Despite <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to mention a passage from the Theititus, which relates to your quest for two reasons. First, because it refers to the apotropite effect of the daimonion in the sense that it uh, prevents Socrates from relating to the bad students who are not really pregnant with knowledge. So, um, because you, uh, you associated the daimonion with, uh, uh, with uh, how ophelimon it is for his students, okay? In this sense, it is specified, the reason why it is ophelimon, it is because it prevents Socrates from associating to the wrong students, the ones who pretend to be, to be pregnant with knowledge. In this passage, um, where um, in the same passage, which refers to the meiotics and all that, we also have a reference to pains and to the pangs of birth, okay? But the term is odinai, if I remember well. And third association, this is all associated to Artemis, Apollo's sister, within the same constellation. Um, of course, we should elaborate on that. And I'm sorry, I missed your talk in Paris last year, but Rosella is here. And I'm sure that she has more to say about that because we have been discussing that, all that in Paris uh, over the last uh, two years. So this is just to, you know, to remind you this text so that you can fill in the small Thank gap. You. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much for this contribution. I hope next time we meet in person again <laughs> soon. <laughs> Me too, and soon. You're most welcome, anytime. <laughs> you too, you too, Sibana. Um, about the Tititus, of course, there are plenty of passages, uh, plenty of occurrences which I didn't have uh, mm -hmm. I mean, um, the opportunity to include because, mm -hmm. I mean, we already have uh, nearly 40 texts, which is yes, more yes, than exactly. enough for 40 minutes to discuss. Um, it's one text per minute, more or less, which is yes. a lot. And yes. um, no, this, is, this is specific to course, your question. Of yes. course, what I said should be really tested um, by looking at all different occurrences of Daimonion, of Teyamoira, of Tuncano, of Simbaino, everything which I think is relevant to, to what I said. I mean, this, uh, I mean, I, I'm looking for a common thread between these yes, different yes, yes. Uh, uh, religious experiences. And um, this is just an attempt. Maybe it's a wrong attempt, but I tried at least. Most uh, scholars don't even try, you know, you have these very, very, uh, I mean, uh, peculiar interpretations where you have only one aspect of Socrates' religiosity developed, maybe only in one author or in one dialect, maybe only of Plato or one work. And I think this does not make, make much, much sense because one should look at the whole picture if possible. So this thank was you. I, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Thomas Lebon. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. This was really interesting. And I'm particularly really happy to see people finally taking the Thea Moira uh, stuff in Plato uh, more seriously. I think this is something that deserves a lot more scholarly attention. Uh, so two quick questions. One on uh, your comments in response to an earlier question about the prophetic dim uh, dimension of Socrates' character. So it seems like in a lot of instances where Socrates is explicitly ascribed a prophetic gift or prophetic character uh, in the dialogues, they don't actually have anything to do with him helping other people develop their philosophical abilities. So three quick examples, very start of the Theaetetus, when Theaetetus is carried uh, past the interlocutors dying, uh, the interlocutor says, I'm amazed at Socrates' mantic gift, both at other instances and now. And it seems like all that Socrates was predicting there is that Theaetetus was going to die. That's not a question of improving him, right? At the start of the Crito, he's prophetic insofar as he foretells the arrival of the ship back from its uh, mission to, to Delos. But again, that doesn't seem to be a question of benefiting his philosophical interlocutors. Uh, 
And then finally in the Phaedo, when he's talking about his uh, mantike techne that he shares with the swans, that's given him access to a general philosophical truth, the immortality of the soul. But that's not a question of specifically benefiting his interlocutors. If anything, the person who's benefited from his knowledge of the immortality of the soul is Socrates himself. And then second question, I would like to hear you say a bit more about what exactly you think Thea Moira is. So, in particular, I'm worried about the attempt to closely connect the daimonion to Theomora because they seem to be two radically distinct forms of divine intervention in life uh, in Plato. So just to give you one example, and here I'm drawing on the work of Suye uh, in his paper in the 30s on Theomora, which is one of the last things published on this. Uh, so this is from the very end of the Critias, and I'll just read the translation from Hackett. Because these were their thoughts and because of the divine nature that survived in them, they prospered greatly as we have already related. But when the Tutheu Moira in them began to grow faint, as it was often blended with great quantities of mortality and as their human nature gradually gained ascendancy, at that moment, in their inability to bear their good fortune, they became disordered, yada, yada, things go to... Um, and so there, Thea Moira, as Suye wants to suggest, is actually a question of character or a part of nature that's contrasted with our anthropina, fuses, uh, rather than it being some sort of like occurrent divine revelation like the daimonion is going to be. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you can fit texts like that and that understanding of Thea Moira into the account of Thea Moira that you're trying to develop in the paper. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. But what I need now is the exact um, Stefano's pages of the passages you're referring to, because otherwise I uh, am not even able to, to look. To sure. Look so the, the critiest passages, the uh, one, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, tell me, yes. Uh, so the Critias passage is 121a to b. Uh, it's right at the end of the dialogue. The Theaetetus passage is 142c. Uh, the Crito passage is right near the beginning. Uh, there I was just going off my memory. I'll pull it up in one sec. Uh, I find it beginning. And the Fido? And the Fido passage is right before the mythology swan, bit. Swan, so uh, that's going to be around 84, 85. Okay, 80, 84, 85. Okay, I have to look at those passages because and now I don't uh, recall the exact context of each of them. Um, what I can say is that the connection between, um, what I can say right now without looking at, the, at those passages because I have, I have to look at them carefully uh, to see if the translations uh, work and everything. I mean, you need to understand uh, properly a passage. But what I can say is that the connection between Teira Mora and Daimonion is explicit in the Theagus, which of course may be not a very good argument because it's pseudo-Platonic. We don't know whether this is Plato or not, but there you have a Teia Moira in the, in the dative form. So through or by Teia Moira, you get, you have the daimonion more or less. This is what in this passage we have. And I brought, I, we, I have this passage here in the handout. You have it in the handout. So in that case, there is a very close connection between the two. Um, what happens in other passages, I'm not sure of. Um, Socrates has, of course, uh, the divine gift of foreseeing things, but uh, maybe this benefit, which uh, we don't find in the, in, the, in the text, is suggested by a context, maybe. This is what I, I, I can say, with, uh, what I would say right now about those instances you, you refer to, theater, to scry, to fido. Uh, maybe you have there a general context which suggests uh, and the benefit Socrates is providing through his divine gift, maybe, because there is the death. Uh, we know that the death is the greatest good in, in that specific situation. So Socrates foresees his death, and this has to do with something which is <clears throat> beneficial in his own view. So this is what I would say right now, but I need to look at those passages with, with great attention. So thank you very much. Thanks for your answer. Okay. Um... Uh, probably uh, our last question, Francesca Pentasulio. Yes. So thanks, Alessandro, for um, for your presentation. And I have just a, a small remark uh, regarding the um, role of uh, Socrates Teia Moira in in the improvement of his associates. 
Um, so um, one of the consequences of Socrates improving others to Teyamoira, and a problematic one, I, I would say, is his um, lack of control uh, over the outcomes of uh, his teaching activity. This is not explicit in Eskinis, but is explicit in the uh, Theagis. So the passage is uh, 129e, uh, 130e where Socrates distinguishes his own pedagogical activity from the study of those who are in control of the benefits of uh, their teaching. So uh, the same point is made also in the Theaetetus, and, and this is true in some sense, maybe uh, also for Xenophon's Memorabilia, where Alcibiades' failure uh, implies in some sense that Socrates was not responsible for the final outcomes of of his, uh, of his education, of his teaching. So um, my question is just, uh, how do you interpret th this aspect that could turn out to be a problematic one uh, within this picture of Socrates as in, uh, improving others thanks to his divine dispensation? Thank you, Francesca, very much for these uh, very acute remarks. Um, I don't know if you if you know what Geyser wrote about this Theages passage. Uh, Konrad Geyser, in his I think very maybe his best book about protractics in Plato, um, Geyser claims that the, exactly the opposite of what you're suggesting. He claims that the Theia Moira is not is is of course a chance. It, I mean a chance Socrates cannot control. I mean it comes from a, from a chance. It's uh, um, nothing uh, that uh, has to do with, with choices, with will, with uh, the cons conscience, what one could say of Socrates. But um, according to Geyser, Theia Moira is a kairos. I mean, the Theia Moira Socrates has for Alcibiades is that kind of eros Alcibiades needs in that peculiar moment in that kairos. So this is the way Geyser reads that. And I have to go deeper into it because I really don't know where he gets this from, where he gets this kairos, I mean, dimension of the teiremoia, but this would go in exactly in the opposite direction of what you're suggesting, that Socrates is not in control of his teaching. Uh, maybe the fact that he is not in control is the, the, the sign or the a hint um, about the fact that in the end, the outcome will be positive because uh, Teia Moira always um, gets the proper kairos of uh, everything which Socrates does. So Teia Moira has an implicit uh, also timing, which is always a good one for Socrates when uh, Socrates, when it intervenes. I think this is, um, if we look at the occurrences of the daimonion, every time the daimonion intervenes, the daimonion intervenes not in every moment, but in the most important moments of Socrates' life. So uh, there, a kairos seems quite, quite, quite evident. So the, the proper moment where this um, divine entity intervenes. All right, well, let's thank our speaker for a very rich presentation and uh, thank all of you for um, an equally rich uh, discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure to see um, uh, scholarly friends every two weeks from four continents and welcome to those who happen to be new this week and we hope to see you again. So um, just uh, to repeat, Dorothea Freda will be speaking in two weeks on February 17th. Um, uh, goodbye. Goodbye.